Hello everyone. When you first get infected with varicella zoster virus, you get varicella, aka chickenpox. And while the acute symptoms of chickenpox usually subside very quickly, the virus never really goes away. Its genetic material persists in sensory ganglia. And for decades, usually, this latent infection produces absolutely no symptoms. But as the person gets older and their immune system gets weaker, especially specific immunity against varicella zoster, the virus gets the opportunity to reactivate. Only this time it doesn't cause varicella, it causes shingles or herpes zoster. So basically the name of the virus tells you what it can cause. First infection, varicella, reactivation, herpes zoster or shingles. Your typical patient will be a person in their 70s or 80s who will present with intense acute unilateral pain somewhere in the trunk, in the chest or in the abdomen and after a few days this typical herpetic rash will appear in the same place where the pain started. Now since the virus reactivates in the sensory ganglion and travels along the affected nerve, the rash can appear anywhere from the spine all the way down to the median line. If it crosses the median line, it's unlikely that this is herpes zoster, right? Because if the nerve cannot cross it, the rash cannot cross it either. So this rash will typically affect one dermatome, maybe two neighboring dermatomes. The rash is very characteristic, so usually you won't need any kind of diagnostic tools. You will know that this is shingles, but in the rare cases when you are not sure, you can take the scrapings of these blisters and send them for PCR for varicella zoster virus. Of course, if PCR is available. But again, most of the time you will know that this is herpes zoster and you will simply start treatment. Usually you will use either acyclovir or valacyclovir. These are antivirals directed against herpes viruses and basically either one should be adequate. Valacyclovir is a little bit more convenient because the patient has to take it three times a day instead of five times a day and the duration of treatment should be seven days. Now as a general rule we should start treatment within 72 hours after the first appearance of the rash. But if you see that there are still new vesicles forming, well, we can start treatment even later than that, so after four or five days. But beyond that, antiviral treatment probably won't make much difference. So in short, this is your typical garden variety intercostal herpes zoster that you will see a million times. So now, let's turn our attention to the things that should alert us to the possibility that treatment might not go as planned. Number one, immunity. Remember how varicella zoster virus reactivates when your patient's immune system gets weakened, usually by old age. This is why shingles is uncommon in people younger than 50. Most patients are in their 70s or 80s, right? So when you do see a young person with shingles, you should ask yourself, why would this happen to this patient? Are they immunocompromised perhaps? So ask them, are they on any kind of immunosuppressants? Do they take corticosteroids for some autoimmune disease or are they organ transplant recipients? Anything. Now, many times you will find nothing, but you still have to ask. But there is one cause of immunodeficiency that you should never miss. And this is, of course, HIV. So bottom line, if you have a young person with shingles, you should recommend testing for HIV. But not only that, in truly immunocompromised patients with shingles, this seemingly localized infection can quickly become systemic. So make sure that you examine the entire surface of the skin looking for signs of generalized zoster. This will look kind of like a mix between chickenpox and herpes zoster because you will see these red patches and blisters everywhere, but they will definitely spread beyond these one or two dermatomes that are usually affected. If you have a patient with generalized zoster, they need to be hospitalized and they need to be treated with intravenous antivirals. Please don't forget that. Because not only the skin is affected, many times the liver, the lungs, the brain, all sorts of organs can be affected and this is a life-threatening condition in an immunocompromised patient. But not only that, 
in immunocompromised patients, this rash can look atypically, can look more severe than your normal zoster with a hemorrhagic or necrotic areas. So be careful with immunocompromised patients, even if their rash doesn't appear to be very impressive in the beginning. And of course, if they present after four, five, six, or 10 days of illness, you should still start antiviral treatment because many immunocompromised individuals simply cannot control this infection. Okay, sign number two, fever and systemic symptoms. Fever with rigors and chills is really unusual in patients with your typical uncomplicated intercostal zoster. So if your patient does have fever, and especially if it appeared after the onset of rash, you should suspect a complication. First, look for signs of cellulitis. These painful blisters, people often scratch them, they touch them. This is the perfect opportunity for bacteria like streptococci and staphylococci to enter the skin and cause cellulitis. Now, of course, it's not always easy to discern whether there is a bacterial superinfection because the skin is red to begin with and these blisters can often be yellowish. This can look like pus. Nevertheless, you should take a close look and if you suspect cellulitis, of course, you will start antibiotics. And generally, if your patient with shingles has fever and they look unwell, again, you will look for signs of systemic illness, meaning generalized zoster. Next, the location of the rash also matters. While intercostal zoster is by far the most common, if you see herpetiform rash on your patient's forehead and the area around the eye, this is ophthalmic zoster. And this is significant because this virus can affect pretty much every structure of the eye and it can result in permanent loss of vision if not treated properly. So if you do suspect ophthalmic zoster, it's a good idea to consult an ophthalmologist. They will be able to better assess the degree of involvement of the affected eye and they will prescribe topical treatment like topical corticosteroids in addition to systemic antivirals. Now in mild cases, you can use oral antivirals, but personally, me and my colleagues, we prefer to use intravenous antivirals whenever we deal with ophthalmic zoster, especially if there is any kind of pain in the affected eye and if there is any kind of vision impairment. And finally, pain. Unfortunately, pain is an integral part of shingles because this virus does so much damage to the affected nerve. Many patients continue to experience pain for weeks, sometimes even months, even with timely treatment. And they often ask us, does this mean that they need more antivirals? And the answer is definitely no, no, absolutely not. Viral replication is done, inflammation is done, but the damage done to the nerve persists and it will take time to recover. So these patients will need all sorts of painkillers. Some of them will need to see a specialist for pain management, but what they don't need is additional antiviral therapy. As always, you can download the PDF with the summary of this presentation and a few extra tips. You will find the link in the description of this video. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.